All right. Hello, everybody. This is your favorite Bronze Age comic book podcast, Flea Market Fantasy. I am your co-host, Mike L. And as always, I'm joined by... Michael Dell of the LCS Hockey Radio Show. That's right. And this week, it is your pick, Mike Dell. So why don't you tell us what we are reading this week? Yes. We will be <laughs> reviewing... <laughs> well, I guess the official title is The Hands of Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. Yeah. Issue 48 from 1977 but it, you know the cool kid is just called master of kung fu right 248 and as i mentioned last week there's going to be a movie coming out that's just going to simply be called oh shit what is it i think shang shang chi and the ten rings that's Something. right so and i believe we, i believe ahead. the ten rings refers to like a martial arts school okay where they teach the various forms of fighting based on the mandarin's 10 rings okay I okay i read so that probably it's gonna po- probably bring in a different or the real mandarin right like you remember in iron man 3 when they had that actor playing mandarin right <laughs> yeah yeah oh, i thought that was a cool twist but whatever <laughs> so uh yeah the real mandarin he you always got to worry about guys who fight with jewelry <clears throat> that's always yeah rough that's always tough. oh like come on green team. lantern come yeah. on underdog yeah. underdog who's underdog on Un- you don't know underdog no i don't think oh is it a cartoon yeah cartoon underdog oh of course of course now i remember underdog with the secret compartment of his ring he feels with an underdog super oh, energy right, okay. <laughs> that's right <laughs> okay anyway master of kung fu a couple of reasons why i picked this mike l Yes. Uh, one, one of my earliest childhood memories when I was a kid, like I was like three years old, was jumping around in my basement to the song Kung Fu Fighting. Remember okay, of course. Everybody was Kung Fu Fighting. Yeah, it's yeah. great. So I loved it. Uh, and then I also heard that the Master of Kung Fu was one of the most critically acclaimed Marvel titles of the 70s. Yep, I've heard that too. So I was like, oh, all right. Well, let's try it out. Because I've never read any of it. I have no concept of shang chi <laughs> or what it takes or what it requires to be a master of kung fu <laughs> but uh so we'll find out today you excited i'm a little bit excited <laughs> <laughs> my excitement is measured let's put it that way <laughs> all right well uh let's talk a little about the uh, shang chi uh basically all right basically he's bruce lee all right i mean that's yes <laughs> let's be clear and also we should point out this comes out of a phase in marvel where they were kind of imitating all of the trends at the time right like luke cage was the black exploitation this was obviously kung fu i'm sure there's other ones that we're forgetting oh yeah they, a ghost rider would have been like evil knievel right oh that's right yeah yeah and uh the, the title uh well we'll, we'll we'll get into it as i go along okay, but sure. uh shang chi he was raised by his father fu manchu to be the ultimate assassin now, if you're not familiar with Fu Manchu, uh, this was like a Pulp Fiction character created by Sax Romer, a British novelist. And his first uh, novel was uh, The Mystery of Dr. Fu Manchu in 1913. Mm-hmm. And he wrote 13 novels between 1913 and 1951 about Fu Manchu. So Marvel acquired the rights to the Fu Manchu character. And they said, well, we got to do something with this. And... <laughs> They also wanted to cash in on the uh, Kung Fu craze, like you said, because th- this all started around 74, and I, Bruce Lee was super popular right then. Right. Like, like he had died already. And then, like, he had died a year before Enter the Dragon even was released. But then, when right. Enter the, I think Enter the Dragon came out maybe 73. I think so. So there was like a huge craze about Kung Fu, and everyone loved Bruce Lee. So this is a way they decided to create this book basically as a way. For people to still experience Bruce Lee, even though he was dead. They're like, oh, look, here's Bruce Lee alive in the comic books. <laughs> but of course, they didn't call him Bruce Lee. They called him Shang-Chi. Right. And uh, the creators were uh, Steve Englehart. Him and again. Jim, and Jim Starlin. And, and by the way, <clears throat> when I was reading this, remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about uh, the Defenders? Yeah. And I said there was an acclaimed run on the Defenders right. in the 70s. Englehart did write the Defenders, but I guess the real crazy stuff was Steve Gerber. Yes, that's true. And that's what you thought when we were talking about it, but I did confirm that okay. <laughs> when I read this. Okay. So yeah, Gerber got 
really gets acclaimed for the defenders, not so much Englehart. All right, but anyway, uh, the first appearance of Shang Chi was in Special Marvel Edition fifteen in nineteen seventy three. Okay. And then he also appeared in issue 16. And then issue 17, they just renamed the series as Marvel was wont to do back in the day. Mm-hmm. And they called it the Hands of Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. Hmm. So those first 16 issues are actually special Marvel edition. Yeah. Very confusing back in those days, eh? With all the titles. I meant to look up more about that series, the first 15 issues, but I forgot. Okay. <laughs> I was just doing this research like moments ago. Okay. So do you have any experience with the special Marvel editions? No, I I have none. I don't think, um, if I were to go back, I mean, I think maybe, um, that might've been, was it, it might've been Thor for a while, like reprinting Thor, but I could be wrong about that. I'd have to go look at it. Yeah, this would be the part where most like hosts would, like Google stuff, but we're too lazy, so don't yeah. Worry well, I you know what? I, I'm quietly googling as you're talking. Oh, okay, cool. It's taking me too long. <laughs> no, like I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing <laughs> Sergeant Fury. Uh, yeah, it's all reprints, right? I think. Oh, okay. As far as I yeah. know, yeah. no idea. Yeah, Again, totally sorry, I forgot to look that up. <laughs> um, but you know, this is why the show's interactive. We just say a bunch of bullshit, and then everyone else listening has to like confirm it on their own. So that's well, you fun. know. You know, it's funny. I'll have you know that I was correct. The first uh, four issues were Thor reprints, and I have number three, and that's why I knew that. Oh, look at you. You See? really are a comics genius. Yes, what? thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Englehart and Starlin left the book after issue 17. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, they did, uh, wow, the first issue, actually, <laughs> when it was called <laughs> Master of Kung Fu, and then they left. Um Engelhart left due to editorial disputes with Roy Thomas. Interesting. And St- Starlin left after discovering the racist nature of the Fu Manchu novels. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, again, those novels were written in 1913, 14. And, uh, I guess the first three are written between 1913 and 1917. Sure. And, and, he, and the, the author was British. So it was all about the yellow peril, quote unquote. Okay, yes. And, and it uh, relied heavily on stereotypes about Chinese people. Uh-huh. So Fu Manchu is seen as kind of a racist character um, due to the stereotypes. So sure. that's why Starlin said, all right, I'm out of here. Uh, but the series did run until uh, issue 125, ending in 1983. Mm-hmm. So there you go. That's uh, You know, that's, I'm just yeah. going to fill in one thing at the end. I believe I recently read a huge article about how it all ended. And I hate to say it, but it might have been your boy, Jim Shooter. <laughs> that caused, uh, uh, I believe, uh, what's his name, the writer. Um, Doug Match. Yes, him to uh, leave because he kind of came in out of nowhere and said, oh, by the way, I want you to, even though you've been writing it for over 100 issues and it's one of our best sellers, I want you to completely <laughs> change it. And yeah. so Doug Match was like, F that. And that's why he left and went to D.C., as far as I know. Yeah, I believe that is true. Yeah, Shooter uh, got a lot of people mad at him. Yep, a lot of enemies. Uh, Mench left with issue 122. And then uh, they finished it up, and I, I believe the story ended like they had, they had tied up the uh, storyline with his dad finally because that was basically the the through line for the entire series was Shang Chi trying to defeat his dad Fu Manchu. Okay. Um, so they had tied that up, and then Mench left, and then I think uh, Shang Chi ended up just like retiring to a Chinese fishing village and just okay. live his life. That's okay. what he did. <laughs> but. Uh, so Fu Manchu, uh, a little bit more about him. Uh, so when Marvel lost the rights to Fu Manchu, they then changed the character's name to Zhang Zhu. Okay. So if you read about him now in Marvel, he's Zhang Zhu, not Fu Manchu. And he, he's like this criminal mastermind. He always wanted to take over the world. And, he, and he, he's basically, he's discovered immortality. He uses something called the Elixir Vitae to prolong yeah. his life. And he also feasts on the blood of his ancestors. And uh, and like his like his sons and daughters, he'll like drink their blood and stuff to mm. keep him. Yeah, so he's he's a weird dude, and, and he he runs an army called the Psy Fan. Yes, the Psy Fan, and he always wants to take over the world. But <laughs> opposing Fu Manchu, Michael, are the brave souls of MI6, the British secret intelligence agency. Right. So in the novels, uh, the guy opposing him is a fellow named Dennis Nyland Smith, 
and okay. he is carried over into the comics, and we see a little bit of him in this issue. And so, so Fu Manchu had raised Shang Chi, like I said, to be the ultimate assassin, and he was kind of manipulating Fu Man or er, er, Shang Chi, uh, monkeying with his brain to make him think that, hey, I'm a good guy, I'm your dad. So he would send him off on missions and stuff, but he he would uh, mentally uh, manipulate him to to like give him a, a skewed version of the world. So. Okay. Like he would send, uh, he sent Shang Chi to assassinate this guy named Doctor Petri, and uh, he told him that Doctor Petri was an evil guy. He wanted to, you know, dominate the world, so we have to kill him to save the world. So Shang Chi kills him. But then uh, Doctor Petri is a buddy of Dennis Nyland Smith. So Dennis Nyland Smith says, "Hey, hey, Shang Chi, he was a good guy. Your father's the evil guy." So he like convinces Shang Chi to like, you know, reevaluate his life, and Shang Chi realizes, "Oh shit, I, I'm really." killing people that my dad's an evil criminal mastermind so he vowed to dis- to bring down his father and destroy his father's criminal enterprise so shang chi started working with dennis nyland smith and mi6 hmm. and how how far into the story is this is this like the first issue or is this like later this stuff all started with uh, doug mensch when he took over the book ah uh, gotcha okay. and like issue 20 he okay. started laying the groundwork for this gotcha um the, the issue we'll be reviewing today, uh, again, Mensch took over in 20, and uh, we're on issue 48. So all this stuff's already been discussed. We're right in the middle of uh, a, f- we're in chapter four of a six-part storyline where Shang-Chi and MI6 are infiltrating Fu Manchu's mountain fortress. Yes. To bring them down. And I, I believe in like issue 50, uh, he... He seems to kill Fu Manchu, but Fu Manchu doesn't die, and he comes back, and they fight again. So the the story really doesn't get resolved until, like I said, like around one twenty two. But okay. uh, yeah, Fu Manchu, the evil Fu Manchu. So <laughs> MI MI six, a couple other characters we needed to mention. Uh, oh, by the way, Dennis Nyland Smith, uh, right. Fu Manchu had his sumo bodyguard crush Smith's legs. Okay. But then eventually Shang Chi. Convinced Smith that uh, the paralysis was really just uh, psychosomatic. So he, <laughs> okay. So he could walk again. Now he's fine. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> but, I, I, but I guess that's why he doesn't go on these missions. Because in this book, we see him not on the mission. Gotcha. He's, I'm guessing he might still be in a wheelchair at this point. I'm not sure. But uh, the other uh, Dennis Nyland Smith's right-hand man is a fellow named Black Jack Tar. Right. <laughs> Black Jack Tar. And he's just a, a tough spy guy. And he was originally sent to to defeat or to kill Shang-Chi after Shang-Chi killed Dr. Petri. And then they got, um, you know, they convinced Shang-Chi to fight on the good side and everything. But Black Jack Tar is kind of a uh, a racist a little bit towards Chinese. Uh, okay, yes. He's a, he's a bigot. Uh, he, he calls uh, Shang-Chi a Chinaman right. throughout this issue a lot. But it, it's really a character arc. They start off like showing uh, Black Jack Tar as being like a bigoted guy towards the Chinese people and Shang Chi. But then as the stories progress, you know, you see that growth of a character, and then he becomes, you know, Shang Chi and him become chums. Right. So, so that's cool. Um, also, there's a fellow named Clive Reston, and he's basically James Bond, and it's hinted that he's the son of James Bond. Really? Okay. And a nephew of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, then we have a lady named Lyko Wu. Mm-hmm. And she's the femme fatale, uh, you know, sexy lady spy. And she's in a relationship with Clive, Clive Reston, but she also starts having feelings for Shang-Chi. Look out. Mm-hmm. Love triangle. Um, and then I guess eventually she, she kicks Clive Reston in the curb and she... Goes with some other dude who turns out to be a evil assassin, but uh, that's a, l- a story for a later date. Then we have James Larner, who's another MI6 uh, agent, and I don't know if you picked up on this, Michael, but the uh, we mentioned Doug Mensch is the writer, and uh, the artist in this issue is Paul Galassi, right? And we'll talk about him later, but he really liked uh, the movies and basing characters on film stars. Okay. Now, the James Larner, did you notice that? Uh, any of these characters looked like people when you're uh to be honest no okay <laughs> now now when i tell you this go back and look but james larner 
was based on Marlon Brando. Really? And you can really see it when you you go back and yeah, look. Well, I have to go back and look, yeah. And of course, he based Shang-Chi on Bruce Lee. There, there are some panels in here where Shang-Chi looks exactly like Bruce Lee. Right. Um, uh, some other stars he based, uh, like Black Jack Tar, I think, or, or Clive Reston was based on uh, a combination of Basil Rathbone, the old Sherlock Holmes actor, sure. and uh, Sean Connery. Okay. James Bond. And he based some other guy on David Niven, which was <laughs> nice, and uh, James Coburn and uh, Marlena Dietrich. Not in this issue, but he did base a character on Marlena Dietrich. So, and Groucho Marx. <laughs> There's a character based on Groucho Marx at some point. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm looking at Marlon Brando right now on page 11 or whatever. So <laughs> yeah. Marlon Brando. Okay. You can really see it. Like, I, like I didn't pick up on it either until I read it. I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. he does look a lot like Marlon Brando. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, another character, uh, the final character we need to mention for this issue, Phalo Sui. I guess what how you would say it. Phalo mm-hmm. Sui. Uh, she's Fu Manchu's daughter and Shang Chi's uh, sister, mm-hmm. and she's kind of like evil sometimes and good sometimes. She basically just goes wherever the uh, does her the most benefit. She sure. plays both sides, and on and in this issue, she's she's helping MI six. Mm-hmm. She's trying to give them info about her dad's fortress and stuff so all right so there's the background now i i was surprised by all this michael because again i had no concept of master of kung fu but when you hear the title master of kung fu and you you kind of sense it's based on bruce lee i thought it was all just like kung fu stuff like just um yeah i had no idea there was this you know james bond or whatever uh angle to it no idea yeah it's really a spy book Mm -hmm. with karate chops right right Uh, well interesting which is, you know, uh, you've obviously seen End of the Dragon, right? Yes, a long but, time ago. But it's actually funny because apparently it was sort of a ripoff of Dr. No. So oh. maybe, yeah, maybe they kind of, I don't know, maybe they got the idea from that. Or maybe Paul Galassi just wanted to draw this kind of stuff, or who knows, right? I don't know. Um, well, it seems like Galassi, uh, well, we'll talk about him later. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, I think this was mainly Doug Match. Okay. Yeah this though in terms of the spy stuff and everything but although uh mench and glacy were co-plotting a lot of this so well the other thing too and we can talk about this later but when i see look at paul glacy i see a huge jim steranko influence. yes we'll definitely talk about right. that <laughs> so yeah that could also be where that comes from right agents of shield so that is true yeah um so let's get to this issue it's called city in the top of the world not on the top of the world, in the top of the world. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like an underground fortress. Uh, chapter four of a six-part storyline. And let's talk about the cover, Michael. The cover was drawn by Marie Severin. Yeah, I really like the cover. Yeah, to describe it for the kids. Uh, so we've got uh, Master of Kung Fu, Marvel Comics Group, The Hands of Chang- Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu, this big title. And then we've got uh, Shang-Chi... Karate chopping uh, a group of goons here, knocking them off this sort of bridge, I guess you'd call it, over this headquarters. Well, not to get arc. technical with you, Mike, but it's really a palm thrust strike to the Of chain. course it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. It's not yeah. a karate chop. Yeah, I guess you're right, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he's on a bridge, and he's fighting all these dudes in green outfits. These, these, these would be the Sai Fan, uh, Fu Manchu's army of henchmen. And they got like nunchucks, and they all kind of look very similar. Um, yes. But they're running over this bridge, and there's a big red box at the bottom of the page. And what does it say in there, Michael? Shang Chi's fight against his father, Fu Manchu, continues on the Bridge of a Thousand Dooms. <laughs> yeah, how about that? Bridge of a Thousand Dooms. But I love the uh, composition of this cover. And it's like great. the perspective, and because it's in this underground fortress, you can see they're like in some sort of a cave setting, and the way the bridge is arched and uh, just it, it kind of looks like a alien planet or sci-fi mm-hmm. like sure uh, architecture of these little contraptions and buildings in the background. It's it's pretty pretty cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, like Marie Severin. I'm not sure if we've talked about her before, but she's like Never. a veteran. Yeah, she's she's the only woman artist female artist of the 60s to work at marvel and she was there from the very beginning i believe and uh she was there for decades to come i think she was still working in the 90s i think 
yeah, this is really strong stuff in terms of like mm-hmm. perspective and composition. And uh, if I was a kid and I saw this cover, I'd want to buy it. You know? For sure. Also, yeah. inked by Dave Cockrum, right? I think I saw that in the credits. Oh, okay. I wasn't yeah. even sure who inked it. Um, but uh, yeah, there's one where a guy's about, a guy's got his armor on uh, Shang Chi's neck, and he's about to stab him in the chest. So that, yeah, there's a lot of action going on here. Mm-hmm. So good stuff. And I like the. Uh, this is thirty cents, by the way. Yep. In 1977, and I like the the Shang Chi picture underneath the uh, price, the little character box or whatever we call sure. those things. Yeah, is that nice. Jim Starlin? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I don't know. It doesn't look, look like it, it doesn't look like Ulysses at all. No, you're right. No, it could, yeah, it could be Jim Starlin. Hmm, so, I don't know. Yeah. All right, so let's get to the uh, book here, Michael. Um, <laughs> how about you? Would you like to read the? Uh, we we oh, got the, the Stanley presents Master of Kung Fu, but above that we have the sure. little intro and in quotes. Would right. you like to read that? Because I think that sums things up nicely. <clears throat> so call me Shang Chi, as my father did when he raised me and molded my mind and my body in the vacuum of his Honan Honan China retreat. I learned many things from my father. Since then, I have learned that my father is Doctor Fu Manchu, the most insidiously evil man on earth. And that to honor him would bring nothing but dishonor to the spirit of my name. <laughs> Stanley presents Master of Kung Fu. I love it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, now, let me just say, I love this splash page. This is tremendous. I have very mixed feelings about the art. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, yeah. We'll definitely get into yeah. that. But I think here is like the best panel he does in the book. I think this is tremendous. Yeah, it's really good. It's like another cover, right? This is very much Jim Starenko. Yes, 100%. That's what I was this thinking. Is, this is absolutely Jim Starenko. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, we see Jack, uh, Black Jack Tar, the MI6 agent, and he's a uh, fellow with black hair and a black mustache, and he's wearing a purple outfit, and he's got like uh, mountain climbing boots on, and he's hanging f- from the side of a mountain with a rope, and he's got a gun in his hand, mm-hmm. and there's there's dudes on the bottom of the panel like shooting up at them and there's helicopters in the background and the moon behind some mount. It's just great. Yep, <laughs> I, lo- I love it. Yeah, like everything with like the guys shooting, like the detail of like the snow. There's a lot of effort put into this. this is nice. Yeah, because Blackjack is like staring at us. Right. Uh, we're right at the camera and he's real big and then all this other stuff's going on in the background. But it's tremendous and very Starenko. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, then, and then the next page, Michael, we get some more Starenko. Get uh, like, yeah. yeah, I gotta admit, this is pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Like, you got Describe this it. sixteen, no, is it tw- sixteen panel uh, grid, uh, you know, page of Fu Manchu going through this headquarters and like beating up one, two, three guys, and then coming down. Well, uh, Shang Chi, Shang Chi is going through. Yeah, yeah, Shang Chi. What did I say? You said Fu Manchu. Oh yeah, sorry, I meant Shang Chi. Yeah, Shang Chi yeah. coming down, kicking ass. Uh, and then, you know, climbing down this rope and, you know, here's the thing is I'm looking at a, it's not remastered. So it's a scan of the original comic. So it's a little bit muddy, but you know, you can still see how good this is. Yeah. We're the, the four, uh, there's four rows of four panel sequences. The first one is Shang-Chi. The second one is Clive Reston. Right. Right. Uh, the third one is, uh, Leiku Wu. And the fourth one looks like Paul Larner. Marlon but they're Brando. all. Yeah, they're all doing things. Right. And then they're like overlaid on top. It's a big two page spread. Right. And so in the background between the panels and like the gutters between the panels is actually the background of a larger picture. Right. Of Fu Manchu's uh, fortress, which is inside a mountain. Right. Which is something else they took from James Bond. Totally. Yes. Well, uh, live and let die, or no? What was the one with the mountain? Um, I think it was live. No, no, no. It was uh, you only live. Tw- you only live twice, right? Or you only? Yes, it was the fifth one. The fifth one, yeah, whatever that the was. Sean like. Connery one, where they right. have to climb into a volcano, and there's right. a. You know, well. And this is again totally Steranko. This whole design here, yep. right? Absolutely. Yep. Um, and so, so agents of Shield. Anyway. And so then we see uh, Fu Manchu, and he's addressing his army, Maiko. Right. And what do you what do you think about this? This oh, is more Steranko. I think the first three pages are very Steranko. Totally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally Steranko. Um Yeah, he's given a speech, you know, hear me, all of you hear the voice of Imperial Fu Manchu basically just saying what his plan is. He's like, uh I uh, blah blah 
Soon all of earth will be nothing more, nothing less than the glory which was old China. I tell you now that the time is near and the destruction of one world, we shall rule another. Oh, by yes, the destruction of one world, we shall rule another. Yeah, he basically wants to bring down the West and uh, bring old China back to life. To... And, it, and doesn't he say in here somewhere he's going to reduce the population to only 10%? Well, uh, that... that comes in later. Okay. His, uh, his daughter fills those details in. Right. Yeah, right. we'll get into the exact plan later when his daughter okay. the <laughs> But his plan is spectacular. Right. <laughs> so... So then we cut over to these guys, and I honestly I can't keep a track of who's who. But this guy comes. <laughs> well, this is Black Jack Tar again. The guy. Oh the yeah, top. yeah, right. He's climbing down the mountain, and he's talking to uh, the the main guy, uh, Dennis. Uh, what was it, Smith? Dennis Wyland Smith, Nylon Smith. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like the boss back at the headquarters. Black Jack Tar's got some little thing in his throat that he can talk, and uh, the boss back in London can hear him. But the boss in London cannot talk to him. Right, so, right. So basically, this whole issue, Black Jack Tar is narrating it. Right. He's telling he's telling the story to the guy back in London. So that's what we're kind of seeing here. And then Black Jack says he's he's trying to approach two figures that he saw, but he couldn't recognize them from a distance. So he's getting up close to him, and he pulls his gun on him, and he sees it's our buddy Larner, Marlon Brando, and he's there with Fu Manchu's daughter. Who, yeah, uh, I can never say her name, but Fallow Sweet. Fa Fallow Sweet, I think. Fallow yeah. Sweet. But you know, again, this is, I mean, we can get, like, we might as well get into the mechanics now. This is an example of, like, to me, this storytelling. Like, I look at this page and I go, okay, I see him climbing down the mountain. Then two panels later, he's pointing a gun. And then they're standing there, but there's no shot establishing their relationship to each other. You yes. Know? It gets confusing, especially, uh, so that ends the page six. And then page seven, the first panel, we see Shang-Chi, uh, Leku Wu, and Reston in the underground cave system. And right. it's like, wait, where, where's Black Jack Tar? And like, right. there was no, it, I wasn't sure if they were all standing in the same place. Exactly, exactly. So it, that was confusing. Yeah, the storytelling there was definitely a problem. Yeah, so yeah, so now we cut over to like you said, Shang Chi and this is uh what's her name again? This is uh, uh Leiku Wu. Leiku Wu. Wu and uh Preston. Preston, I'm I'm not gonna remember these. But anyway, <laughs> they come across this boat that's in this uh underground cave river. So they jump Oh I'm in. sorry. I'm sorry, it's not Preston, it's Reston. Clive Reston. Oh Re Clive Reston. Okay. He's very good. Okay. He's the he's the James Bond possible kid. Right. Best. Okay. And so yeah, they're, they're okay. Well, you know, this boat's here. So from the looks of it, I guess that it's Fu, Man, Fu Manchu's personal pleasure cruiser. So then they decide, okay, we're going to jump in this boat. But now we cut over. We cut back well, to the first. Let me just say, Michael, the boat yeah. is shaped like a dragon. Yes. Yes. It's not like yeah. It's like a uh, what would you call this? It's like not. It's not for. It's like a, I don't know, it's an old style boat you'd see in China, right? You just push it with a stick yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it's kind of like a rowboat shaped like yeah. a dragon. Right. And, and like I said, they're in this underground cave dwelling and there's this river that's going through the cave system. So they're like, oh, we'll take this boat and that'll probably lead us to Fu Manchu. Right. That's their thoughts here. <laughs> so. Right. So then we cut back to the other guys. Yes. Right? Now we see them all standing next, uh, you know, facing each other, chatting it up. Yeah, Black Jack Tar, the Marlon Brando guy, Larner, and Fu Manchu's daughter. Right. But yeah, there, there's no... Uh, again, this is another one of those instances where we could really use those little boxes in the corner, you know, where the narrator says, back on the mountain, you know? <laughs> you know, yeah, usually I complain about those, you're right, but because everybody's wearing purple, yeah. right? It's, yep. It makes it very confusing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's a, I have a lot to say about this, but yeah, it is very confusing. So now we cut so, back. Go this ahead. is where the daughter gives her plan. She feels in the, the background of Fu Manchu's plan, Michael. So right. So now I get into the plan. So yeah, basically he's like, uh, she's like more than 50 years ago. Okay, I'll skip all that. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh yeah. So he intends to either blackmail the entire world into surrendering to him or to simply decimate the world's population and rule over the remaining 10%. And, and then he's he, he plans to do it, Michael, by detonating oh. several nuclear yeah. blasts on the moon. <laughs> on the moon. 
<laughs> detonations of unprecedented intensity and of sufficient force to hurl the moon out of its orbit. Yep. It's ridiculous, but whatever. Oh, and the moon out of its orbit would cause, uh, you know, cataclysms all across the planet and floods and earthquakes and all kinds of stuff. But because mainland China, where it's situated, uh, you know, it, it will be able to withstand things. Right. I mean, that seems like a gamble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. A little bit of a gamble there. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, but so, yeah, pretty uh, large scale planet. Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, so he he's banking on the moon coming into Earth, or you know, destroying everything, but mainland China. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. It seems weird. So, yeah, but. ambitious plan, definitely. I mean, and the thing is, it's so absurd. It, it's like Doctor Evil level ridiculous, but I still love it. You know, because <laughs> really, when you think about it, you got these nuclear bombs anyway. You have enough nuclear bombs to shift the moon out of its orbit. You know, maybe just plant them on Earth. <laughs> yeah, good point, good point. I don't know. Yeah. Save you the trip to the moon. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but, you're right. Well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, uh, Blackjack Tar, he's relating the plan back to, uh, you know, the, the guys in London. And, and <laughs> he's like, this is pretty awkward. He's like, oh, forgot they can't answer me. Because there's like confusion. Yeah, there. that was exactly <laughs> that was that was. I wonder if that was something where Doug Munch, Munch realized that later and went back and added that in. You know, it's it's almost like he has to explain it to the reader why his boss isn't talking to him. Right. You know, Remember and, that you cannot hear. He cannot hear you, sir. Right. Yeah, and then so, the next panel we have Blackjack actually say, "Forgot." Right. Sir Dennis can't answer. The transmitter's only one way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a little strange. Where's the Chinaman? He says, yeah, re reiterating that bigotry that you mentioned earlier, right? Yes. He's calling him the Chinaman. Yeah. So then we see Marlon Brando here. Yeah, that is definitely uh, Brando. <laughs> 100%, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, they're chatting it up. And basically, Ooh. we cut back. I, I, I should mention more about this Larner guy. I didn't get into his sure. background. Because he always seems very aloof, you know, sure. like off on his own. And I guess his backstory is that he was on a mission with his girlfriend and Leiku Wu. And Leiku... Uh, screwed up somehow and it caused his girlfriend to die so then later he was on another mission with Leku Wu and Leku Wu got shot and Marlon Brando just said hey I'm leaving he just left her there to die and Ooh. she Ooh. they eventually saved her and she recovered but because of that he's seen as like an uh, an outsider and like you know he's not trusted by the other team members so so there's a lot of backstory here with all these characters but anyway huh yeah, I mean, coming in at part four yeah. of a multi-part story probably wasn't the best idea, but whatever, right? Yeah. What can you do? Pick yeah. one issue. What can you do? Yeah. So, yeah, so then we cut back to the underground river where they're rowing along, right? Yeah, rest in Shang-Chi and Lake Uwu. Right. And then we cut over to uh, the, what's his name, uh, Fu Manchu's buddies, right? Or his guys? Yeah, C Fan, the army. Some of these dudes are like, uh, they notice the boat coming and right. they're going to prepare a welcoming party for him. So. Right. And, uh, you know, Fu Manchu's still doing his, uh, his speech in this gigantic, uh, you know, underground headquarters. His, all, of his, all of his guys are standing there. Hail Fu Manchu. And then, of course, uh, is this where he introduces Shaka Khan? Um, <laughs> Shaka for, Karn. Oh, well, Shaka right, Khan. right, whatever. Not yeah. to be confused with 80s <laughs> pop star Shaka right. Khan. For now, I introduce to you the immortal Shaka Karn. Right, right, right. I forgot. Shaka Karn. Yeah. Uh, Shaka Karn is like a, uh, well, it's like his son. He says he's his son, but he's an ancestor who he found his body and he rejuvenated him with the elixir vitae. And so he, he says he will replace the son I lost. Basically, he, he's the son instead of Shang-Chi. He's going to be my real son, this guy. Right. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then, and then it's we get a more another kind of a confusing shot where now we cut, cut back over to uh, which group is this? this oh yes, yeah, so this is Shang Chi, Shang Chi, and Reston. Right, and they they see like an opening, but then we see this hand come out of the snow, and it's actually uh, Blackjack. Yeah, because up above he said he was going to. There's the two panels where he says he's going to dive into this little river here and swim his way into Fu Manchu's headquarters. Oh right, right. So then, yeah, so he comes up and joins them. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And so then basically, uh, so now, yeah, they're in this headquarters and uh, all of these, the, the goons are coming towards them. And we see this really cool shot of them kind of like running down these stairs and running from like a, a tunnel from all different directions. That's pretty cool. I like that as far as the art goes anyway. And then the whole time, and this is Blackjack narrating the whole time, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, he's narrating it, speaking it out loud so his boss back in London can hear it, which right. is a cool gimmick, I think. If you want to try yeah. and do this, that's a nice way to do it. Yeah. And then, you know, um, then there's a cool part where uh, he's like, you know, this line might hold us both, Chinamen, and since down is the only way to go, and then shang Chi's like, the only way for you, Tar, but I will go this way. And he kicks open this, like, thing on... A vent? The yeah, but then it's like, then it's a big close-up of his face, so it's kind of hard to tell where he's going, but he's yes. obviously in some, <laughs> I don't know what. Yeah, see, like, I, I got lost here as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, because you just see his foot kicking through this vent, but you don't see where the vent goes or... Right. There's no, lo like, you, you have no uh, concept of where he is in space. You know, right, it's just... exactly. That's exactly, I think, the huge issue here in a lot of these panels. But, I mean, then, you know, you cut to the next page, there's a cool shot of him kind of sneaking around this wall and like there's this guard there and then like him and the guard fight and that's really cool but uh yeah, yeah I'll, really I'll talk about this art later too because i'm not a fan of this but we'll, <laughs> we'll yeah talk about it. yeah but basically yeah it's like okay so now he's just beating up goons right like now we got yeah. some kung fu here some kung fu action spam thap you know and then um and actually it's coming oh yeah so then he grabs these uh what are these things here he's gonna use them kind of like nunchucks right uh, they're just like all these guards, all these Psy fan guards are equipped with like two sticks. Right. Two metal batons with uh, studded ends on them. And right. So he grabs two of them and he starts making his way through the underground fortress. And we should say, while this is all going on, Blackjack Tar is still narrating it because he's beneath them. Like he took the rope and he climbed down to a different level and he can somehow see up through yeah. venting and grates. Uh -huh. And to follow what the what uh, Shang Chi's doing, so he's still narrating things. Right, right. And basically, yeah, you know, he's uh, using these things like nunchucks and fighting them all off. And then we get our direct to me. This is like Bruce Lee, right, a hundred percent. When he's like, now he's pausing, frozen, making weird, spooky like sounds. Ooh, <laughs> you know, like a cat <laughs> under the moon at midnight seems to unnerve the three who are left. They ain't moving. Believe me, Sir Dennis. They were in no rush to get near those sticks. So, yeah, this is 100% Bruce Lee, right? Yep. And then, uh, and then he crosses over this bridge, and he sp spucked block. He beats up another yeah. guy. Well, Michael, yeah. that's, not, that's not just any bridge. That's the Bridge of a Thousand Dooms. Oh, you're yeah. right. I should have mentioned that, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and then well, I, I, I like the sound effects, like the one when he's, he hits, you know, you get the traditional uh, sound effects, fwak, harak, frack, yeah. but then there's one, chump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chump. Oh, it's funny. You're right. Um, <laughs> and then he gets to the last page. We see kind of, or the second last page, we get kind of a cool shot where he's looking. And then we see, is that his own eyes behind him? I think it must be, eh? It's like, you know, this cool design trick. My father has spoken of you. When I was a child, he even showed me your armor, speaking proudly of the legend surrounding you, your prowess as a warrior. But I warn you. I mean to see my father again now, and not even you can stop me. And then we see this is Shaka Khan. I mean, Shaka Khan, right? <laughs> Shaka Khan. Our father no longer claims your blood as his, Shang Chi. Thus, while I am Shaka Khan, your ancestor, your brother, and your father's son, I am also your death. And then they're standing there ready to face off, right? And then, you know, I think this would have been a good way to end it, but then Black, what's his name? Black Jack? He's got to get uh, his situation in, right? Yeah. Well, it's pretty, but it, there's another hook because he's uh, narrating things to his boss and the final box at the bottom says, someone's coming, yeah, sir, Dennis. I know, I know. Right that. this way. I got it cut off before. Good Lord, it's click. Click, yeah. Okay, so maybe that's setting up, well, obviously it's setting up something, but I don't know. I thought it was more dramatic to just end on this, but whatever. Yeah, but it's a it's a great final panel. Like, Shaka Khan looks cool as hell. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's wearing like this old Chinese kind of robe. And he's got a samurai sword, and he's wearing this f this mask. I don't I don't know what it kind of looks like Beta Ray Bill a little bit. A little bit, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> the way his jaw is. Uh, so yeah, he's a really cool design. And uh, then next next issue, perhaps the most emotionally galvanizing episode in the entire series: Shang Chi's epic battle with the immortal Shaka Khan. 
and yeah. much <laughs> more, of course, in part five, Sir Dennis Nyland Smith, the affair of the agent who died. And how about that? Yep. There it is. That's the issue. It's another short one, right? 17 pages. Uh, well, yeah, I guess so. Uh, 30 if you count the ads, I guess, right? Wow, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, usually by the 80s, it was, I think, 22 or 23. Yeah, so this is 22 so used to be the standard back in the yeah, day. Yeah, right. Um, all right, Michael. So, uh, well, let's talk uh, Doug Mensch. Now, we've done him before on the show, so we don't have to get too much into his uh, background. Uh, I believe he did the one Batman uh, Miles Watson joined us for, right? Um, the, uh, Which Batman? Oh, the... Um... The, the, the doppelganger guy. Right, right, right. No, no, no. Was that? Well, that was Michael. No, that was Mike W. Barr. Oh, well, then what did we do? Doug? I know we did Doug Mench on Yeah, him. I can't remember either. I can't remember. I have huh. no idea. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out later. Yeah, anyway, who cares? If you're scoring at home, just yeah. go back, look through the others. <laughs> we'll find something about Doug Mench. But he wrote all but two issues of Master of Kung Fu from issue 20 to 122. So that's nice. quite the run. From uh, 1974 to 83. And then, uh, like I said, in 2010, the Comics Bulletin ranked Master of Kung Fu sixth on their top ten Marvel stories of the 1970s. Really? How about that? Huh. Doug Match. But that's, that's a hell of a run here for Doug Match. And he does a lot of good stuff. Uh, well, of course, maybe we should remind people, though. You, you know Doug Match. He wrote a lot of Batman, right? You, you know, it's funny. I was going to say yes. He, you know what he wrote? Moon Knight. That's what he wrote. The Moon Knight that we Oh, read. that's right. He wrote yes. the, uh, we did the Moon Knight with Bill Sienkiewicz. Right, right. So that was him. And then, you know what's funny is, I did grow up reading a lot of Doug Mensch Batmans, but I could never decide if I liked them or not. Yeah. And then he, yeah, and then he came back in the 90s and did a huge run. And then I just reread the Crisis Crossover Batmans by Doug Mensch, and I didn't like them at all. Oh, so now why not? I, it's hard to explain. I don't know. It's just like, I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't put my finger on what I didn't like about it. But for one, it just didn't seem like Batman, like the characterization was right. But uh, I don't know. I'd have to read a bunch of them to figure out why I don't like it. But he, he did do some that I like because I remember there was one issue where Bruce Wayne loses his fortune and he's basically Bruce Wayne's homeless and like Batman's like sleeping on like a like in a street somewhere. And that was a really cool story. So obviously he's <laughs> a good writer, but I just didn't like the issues that I read recently. So. He can't be Batman unless he's a one percenter, protector of the elite. How can he be sleeping in a park somewhere? Well, maybe I'll pick that issue for the <laughs> next flea market fantasy. We'll see. All right. Let's hope not. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's Doug Mensch. Uh, I liked his writing here. I liked a lot of it. Um, now, again, we're joining just in a small sliver of a much larger story. So Right. Yeah, it's hard to, I mean, maybe I could argue it's a little bit wordy, but nothing was bad about it. Yeah, like the dialogue was solid. Like, right. we only had that one little moment of exposition about the voice recorder thing and how he couldn't hear it and stuff. Uh -huh. um, but everything was pretty solid here. And, again, the, the strength of his writing, I guess, in this uh, was his long plots and story arcs, characterization, and th the big thing was the supporting cast. All these characters have their own motivations and internal conflicts and stuff. So, And I think you get a glimpse of that here, but... We really don't get the full aspect of it because we're not seeing the whole story, but like the love triangles and all the, mm -hmm. the backstory with all these characters and the, the internal conflicts between the team. Right. So that's all good stuff. Um, and, and I like the premise of them having to break into this mountain fortress. And um, and there's a character named Shaka Khan, so that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I like the writing. No problem. Yeah, the writing's fine, definitely. The writing's fine, yeah. All right, let's get to the art. All right. I'm very divided on this. I'm <laughs> yes. very torn. Uh, Paul Gulacy, born in 1953 and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. And he was a big fan of Jim Steranko. There you go. You can tell. He, Stim, Jim Steranko got him into comic books because he saw an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. cover. And uh, so he started studying Steranko. He went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Uh, he worked as an assistant for Marvel artist Dan Adkins. Okay. Are you, do you like? I couldn't remember Dan Atkins. I like don't remember anything of note that he's done, to be honest. No. But apparently, he uh, he inked some Steranko stuff back in the day, so he knew Steranko, okay. and uh, he also so he introduced uh, him to Steranko at one point, and he also introduced him to, uh, or he at least got um, Galacy to work on a little submission packet, and he sent it to Roy Thomas, and mm -hmm. then two weeks later, Roy Thomas hired 
uh, Galassi, and he was like 23 when he broke in. Wow, okay. Uh, or no, no, I'm sorry, he was only 21. Nice. When he broke in. Because his first work was uh, uh, Mobius, the Living Vampire. Morbius, not Mobius. Morbius, right, Morbius. right. Who is Mobius an artist? Mobius, yeah, he's a French artist. Yeah, that's what I that was confusing. He is not a vampire, just if you're at home no. and you're wondering. No, no, he's not. No, Morbius is the living vampire. Right. And that story was in Adventure into Fear, uh, number 20, 1974. Uh, around the same time, he also did some pornographic stuff for Hustler. Really? Look out. Yeah, because I guess they Hustler offered the work to Steranko, and Steranko turned it down. And he said, "But I know a guy you might, you know, want to use because yeah. he kind of draws like me." So he, uh, so Galassi took the jobs, and then he said he turned down because he's young. You know, he needed the money, as they all say when they do porn. Right. But uh, he, he said he turned down other work because you know he considers it like a skeleton in his closet. He doesn't want to <laughs> talk about doing Hustler. Really? Okay. Interesting. <laughs> but who cares? My works work. Um, <laughs> So then uh, Master of Kung Fu 18 is when he started in 1974 and he did 22 issues between issues 18 and 50. Then he, he oh, quit. So he, okay. Uh, what, what were you going to say? Oh, nothing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, he just kind of burned out then on doing the comics. And um, he wasn't a fan of the superhero comics. I think Interesting. You, meant, okay. you brought up something along those lines earlier and I said he would get back to it. So here we are getting back to it. So I think that's why he did Master of Kung Fu and... Then he went and did uh, the Saber graphic novel with our buddy Don McGregor from Black Panther that we talked about a couple weeks ago here on the okay. show. Yep. And then, so then he went and did some work for Eclipse and Dark Horse, and he did some Batman stuff, Michael. Are you familiar with his Batman work? You mean, uh, was it Legends of the Dark Knight? Well, he did two issues of the Batman series, the you know the main one, and then he did a bunch of Legends of the Dark Knight stuff. Well, like eight or nine issues, maybe. Yeah, because that was where I first saw him. He did, I think it was called Prey. I don't remember the storyline. Oh, yeah. I don't remember, but yeah, that was my first exposure to him. And at the time, I really liked him. But I, but I also didn't know Jim Steranko. So when I saw Jim Steranko, I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> I see. Okay. You know? But yeah. He, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, but you keep going, keep going. Uh, so then, uh, yeah, he didn't really have any other major runs on anything, but then in 2002, 2003, he teamed up with Mensch again on a six issue limited series of master of Kung Fu. Oh, okay. Yeah. No idea. <laughs> but he, he was getting all sorts of acclaim here for this stuff. Like, I, I think even like an issue before this, or maybe two issues before this, there's a big blurb on the cover saying Marvel's proud to uh, uh, present some of the like something like the greatest comic art in the world today or something. I, I don't know. I don't really? get it. Yeah. No, I, I have a lot to <laughs> say about the start. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let, let's get into it. Let, let's start breaking down the, uh, but he did win some awards. I think he won the ink pot award in 1981 uh -huh. for like art and stuff. So people love this stuff back then, but man. Well, first of all, I should say people love Jim and I do like Jim Steranko, but I tried to read some of his Captain America comics and I just, it was the same problem. Storytelling was confusing. There was a lot of text and it just is not my cup of tea. And I, and, and this is not, obviously not as good as Jim Steranko and it has those same problems. But the, but the other thing too is that, you know, one panel will be good and then the next one yep. will be terrible. You know, it's like... Yeah. So like the first three pages are excellent. Right. The splash page, the those uh, series of sixteen little panels, and yes, Fu Manchu. Really the first time you see him, and even the like, uh, but yeah, it's very hit or miss. Like you'll get some pictures of uh, people's faces that look cool, and then some that look completely distorted. Um, he draws big eyes. Yeah. Heavy blacks, inking um, areas. Yeah, if you've never seen Steranko, you probably don't understand what we're saying. But Steranko was very innovative. Even, like, he really changed comics. He was like a superstar in comic book art. Right. Um, and then he went on to do a bunch of other stuff. Like, in, like he did the uh, storyboard and stuff for Raiders of the Lost Ark. And the concept oh, really? Art. Okay, yeah. okay. I think I knew that, yeah. But he was like a big, super celebrity comic book artist. Even though, like, his run on Nick Fury, it was only like five issues. Right, right, exactly. It seems like you hear all this legendary stuff about Steranko. You're like, oh, he probably did Fear for like 30, 40, 50 issues. Nope. Yeah. Four or five tops. Yeah. And, uh, but he's very, 
how would you describe his style? It's kind of like uh, more graphic artist yeah, yeah, composition more, and style. It's more of a he's more of a designer, right? Or yes. yeah, it's it's not like a typical comic book. It's more like uh, yeah, like he's more designing it like it's like it's more, static images that are really cool in design right. more than flowing dynamic panel to panel storytelling. Exactly, exactly. And the thing is is yeah, and like Galici has some of that, but he's just not as good an artist for one. And my guess is that the reason some of the panels are really good, like th that's page two, that that sixteen page grid or whatever. I, I my guess is that he's copying from photos because those look photo realistic, right? Yeah, he did do a lot of reference. He did use, uh, like I said, he patterned a lot of stuff on movie actors and stuff, right. so he would use reference. Uh, but like that splash page is tremendous. Like that's classic Steranka right, right there, and so good. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I would recommend everyone try and find this a copy of Galassi's work to just see what it is because it's cool. Like there's some stuff that's really cool, like well designed the compositions, uh, the dark spaces for the inking, and then you'll get like man, and then some of the stuff like the action scenes where Shang Chi's fighting those dudes. It's kind of like the stuff you draw in high school before you understood anatomy and, yes. and uh, yeah. you know, perspective. Like, it is just terrible. Like, Well, especially, okay, that one page we talked about where he's punch, he kicks open that thing and then he's sneaking through uh, yeah. the sewer or whatever. Those bottom panels are terrible. Like, yeah, like a 12-year-old drew them. Right, right. A hundred percent like a 12-year-old. Right, right, like, like when you're in high school, yeah. And you draw a comic book and you you spend two hours shading one face, but it's <laughs> but it's garbage, right? Like, yeah, you spent a lot of time on the detail, but the anatomy is garbage, right? And that's yeah, your right. It's, it's laughably it, bad, the anatomy. Yeah, like like the, the hands are too small or too big, or that you know, everything's wrong, the perspective's wrong, like yeah, yeah he, bad. He, he's drawing muscles but not bodies. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, right, so right. It's uh really, really bad. But still, it's. Uh, I, I heard someone describe it as energetic. I guess you could say that. It's a lot of energy in it, I guess. I don't know. Well, um, I mean, it's creative. Like, you know, it's creative. Like, you know, even that last panel, the last page of him and Shaka Karn, it's like it's clear that he's put a lot of effort into it and a lot of thought into the design of the costume. But other than that, yeah, I just don't see it. Yeah, the Shaka Karn looks great. Um, the, the composition of the panel is great. <clears throat> but again, you, you run into the anatomy issues with Shang-Chi. Yeah. Um, his arm and his shoulders, like, those aren't what muscles look like on the shoulders. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, right, right. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> but it's uh, it's interesting art. I'm mm -hmm. glad I experienced it. But I, I'm really at a loss to why people thought it was so awesome. But I guess it was the 70s. I don't know. A lot of time. <sighs> Yeah, I guess it's just, if this is what you're looking for, then this is your thing. But, like, it also reminded me of when you'd read an adaptation of a movie, you know, like a Star Trek or Star Wars, and the artist is obsessed with getting the likeness of the actor right, but then every, but, but it feels so stiff because he's just copying from photos, you know? And so it's like, you've got these shots like, oh, well, that's clearly Marlon Brando, but it, it doesn't matter because the art itself is not great. It's just a good likeness, you know? If you go through each page, I think you will see that the shots that are static of people just standing and talking are, look really good. Yes. And the shots of people moving and doing some for, sort of action tend to look really bad. Yeah, that's a good... That's a, that, but, you're, yeah. Like in terms of the anatomy and the perspective and everything, it just falls out the window well, when even they're moving. Like the shots of uh, those goons, they're kind of like looking through that thing and, and you know they see the boat on like the viewfinder... There's, there's zero understanding of, like, you, he could have been so creative with showing how they're seeing him, but instead it's like a straight-on shot of him looking down, and then behind him we see a different view screen of what he's seeing. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's almost like he couldn't figure out how to show them both at the same time, so he just showed them separately. I don't know. It's really awkward. Yeah, the, the storytelling is definitely not a strength, panel-to-panel -panel storytelling, but if you get, like, a static... Like, even that, um, if you go two pages after that, well, the next page, we have the nice shot of Fu Manchu addressing the crowd. That's yeah. good stuff. That's yeah, almost like good, yeah. Kirby-era kind of stuff. And, and then the next page, the first panel of 
Fu Manchu's face. I like that. It's, uh, you know, the big eyes yeah, and the shadowing, like but it's too. cool. Like that's a distinctive style of art and it looks solid. Um, and the next panel is pretty good. And then, you know, as we go along, things deteriorate, but yep. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, that's the thing. It's like, this is one of those famous series that you always hear about. Yeah. And now I've read one issue and ee, I don't know if I'd want to read any more, <laughs> you know? I might read a couple more because I'm intrigued by Mench's writing. Um, I mean, here's the thing. I would definitely go back and read the beginning because I'm a huge Steve Englehart fan, you know? So maybe I'd read oh, No, from what I gather, those first three <laughs> issues are oh, yeah. really bad. Okay. Yeah. Well, like, I would probably like, read those and then contrast them with Doug Like Mench's. he's fighting like a, he's karate chopping sharks and stuff. Yikes. Underwater. And so, yeah, it's... <laughs> apparently they're really bad and then when Mench came in he like elevated the stories and stuff so um, but I don't know just what I heard oh, okay. maybe your experience will be different yeah. <laughs> so yeah Master of Kung Fu oh. one of the uh, stories I always wanted to experience and now I have I think I probably will read a few more though would you go back to the beginning though <laughs> uh, maybe maybe I don't it's know. A, yeah, you might as well, right? I'm intrigued by the supporting cast. Right. Put it that way. And how they all fit together. I like the Black Jack Tar guy. He's okay. a visually striking character with the black mustache and uh -huh. um, the way Galacy draws him. So I'm kind of kind of drawn to that guy. Um, and I want to learn more about Lake Goo Woo. Okay. <laughs> the femme fatale. I always love a good femme fatale. Now, there's something else I wanted to say about this, and now I can't really remember because I'm old and I forget things. Just the way it works. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'd, I'm i interested to see, you know, when Marvel does the movie, how how much of this they're going to use, you know? Yeah, I'm guessing that he probably won't be a spy. Yeah, probably not. I don't know. Because if they're basing it on his martial arts school, I'm, they're probably going back to the time when he was training and stuff. But mm. I don't know. Maybe they'll make uh, the Mandarin his dad instead of Fu Manchu. Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's also funny because when I was growing up uh, in, in the 80s, you know, Shang-Chi completely disappeared, right? Like, I think he showed up in Marvel Comics Presents, but I didn't read that. So he, did, he definitely didn't have his own series. And you said what, until the 90s or the 2000s? That, that? Well, 2002, 2003, they did a six-issue six limited series. And then just a couple years ago, they did issue 126. I guess Marvel did some sort of, uh, I forget what they called it. They like brought back old stories for like one issue or something, and they just did an ah, extra issue of these stories. Okay. And our buddy CM Punk, wrestler and failed martial artist, CM Punk, is uh, wrote the issue. Okay, okay. Yeah, so... Huh. Yeah. I actually did try and read that because I, I heard Punk wrote it. And okay. let's just say he is better at martial arts than he is at writing comic books. Okay. Okay. And if you saw him fight in the UFC, you understand that statement. So huh. very bad. Very bad. All right. Um, I'm trying to think what else here about the Fu Manchu uh, and Shang-Chi, Blackjack Tar. Oh, oh, I wanted to talk about the. Because we mentioned this last week on the show, but there are three big eras of uh, Master of Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. the, they all involve Doug Mench's writing. But the first part was Paul Gulacy. Uh Then like another artist came in for a few issues, I believe. Paul Craig was his name. Paul yeah. Craig, okay. I, uh, I do you know him at all? No, I don't. Not at all. Nope. He did a couple issues, but then Mike Zeck came on. And Mike Zeck had a lengthy run. He's and, and people like that era... And then after uh, Zek left, a fellow named, uh, I believe, Gene Day. Oh, yeah, him. I know Gene Day, yeah. Because Gene Day was inking Zek stuff, and then he just became the regular artist after that. So then, But then, sadly, Gene Day died, and then Mensch left at issue, like, right after that. He, he decided to quit, too. So, um, but those three eras are all really considered strong for Master of Kung Fu. And I like Mike Zek. You know? Yeah, me too. Yeah. I like his art. And I'm not really familiar with Gene Day, but so maybe I'll sample. I don't know. I, I'll keep reading this, I think. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> but at least we... Because what other books... I, I guess would Conan be the only other big 70s book we haven't uh, got into? Or wow. Jay, what about Howard the Duck? 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's probably tons that you know we haven't covered in the '70s. Yeah, yeah. I, don't I don't want to spoil any though because I don't want to give away my picks. You know. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right, Michael. So, uh, any final thoughts? Uh, one to ten, Master of Kung Fu. Ooh, uh, oof. I don't know. I'll give it a six, only because I, I mean I haven't read the other chapters in the story. It, it might be better than I realize, but it was definitely hard going in in the middle of the story and. I, I like the idea because it reminds me a little bit of G.I. Joe, and I'm a huge G.I. Joe yeah. fan. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. So I might, I might give this another chance, but so far I don't see what the big deal is, so I'll give it a six. Yeah, I, again, I, I like Mench's writing. I like the concept, the premise. Um, Glacey's art can be either really awesome or really terrible. Yeah. So I'm going to go with a six as well because I can't, I'd go a little higher, but I, I'm just looking at that picture of him kicking those two dudes doing the split and the kick, and it's just, man, I can't believe that got published. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> I agree. I agree. So we'll go with the six. Uh, it probably would have been better if he just left Shang-Chi's shirt on because he really struggles drawing muscles. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. So I don't know. All right. So six, Master of Kung Fu, um, but I might read more. All right, Mike L., Next week. You ready? Yep. All right, man. I know that you're a big fan of this guy. <laughs> Is that sarcasm? Or <laughs> Well, yeah, it's sarcasm. By some metrics, <laughs> he is the most popular DC superhero in North America. Oh, wow. No, let's see. By some metrics. Because obvious, the obvious answers would be Superman and Batman. Yes. So is it one think- of the... We're using a different metric. No, we're using a different metric. We're going by movies. Wow. DC movie that isn't Batman or Superman? Yes. That's, that's, that was fairly, fairly popular. Really? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You got to rack your brain. Come on. I know. I can't think of anything. Uh, well, sure. It wasn't Green Lantern. (laughs) No, no, it wasn't that. I have no idea, Micah. Really? Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, should I give you a hint? Because that's always fun. <laughs> yeah, because I'm always good with hints. Um, oh, jeez. Okay, this character was for many decades considered a joke, but then this character was cast... Batman. No, by, <laughs> by a certain actor that ladies love, and then he did a movie a couple years ago that went on to make over a billion dollars. <laughs> what? How do you oh, not know God. what movie this is? <laughs> I have no idea. I'll give you a hint. He can speak to at least 1.6 million species on Earth. Oh, wait, this doesn't count. What? Wait, it's not Dr. Doolittle, right? I'll give you another <laughs> hint. He's the king of the seven seas. Sinbad? <laughs> come on, come on. Okay. Um, Dude, Aquaman is not the most popular Aquaman, hero ever. Aquaman. His, <laughs> his movie made more money than Wonder Woman, than Batman versus Superman, and Justice League. You, that, is in, that is nonsense. By no metrics yes. available Aquaman. is Aquaman the most popular hero. You need to yes. rescind that statement. No. Under no metric. Under the Mike L metric, maybe he is, but by no other metric is he the most popular DC superhero. You know he, he talks to fish. He's not popular. Oh, but that's what's hilarious, is he is popular. And I looked it up um, recently, and his movie made more money than like it's in the top 20 of all superhero movies for sure it is that's ridiculous yep so we are going to review probably the most famous issue of aquaman ever and it's i, I don't want to spoil it actually no i'm not going to spoil it in case you don't know what happened <laughs> it, well he gets his hand cut off probably no it's not that one that one's coming later but anyway this is his kid uh guys yes Damn it, you guessed it. Okay. Oh, we talked about this. Who? Because who wrote this? Uh, this is David Michelini. Oh, it's Michelini? Yep. David yeah, Michelini and Joe Doesn't Black Pearl. Mantis kill his kid? Or? I can't. I don't want to spoil it. <clears throat> All right. But this is Adventure Comics number 452. And uh, very soon, this, this run was so popular that very soon after, they gave Aquaman back his series. And, you know, back in those <laughs> days, they wouldn't... <laughs> Do a new they, number one, so they just did they take it away because he got like a DUI. And they're like, "All right, you're done. We're not going." Yeah, exactly. So then they gave it back to him. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm super pumped for this. I actually recently read every single Aquaman comic from like 1968 to like 1999. <laughs> wow. You're a very busy guy, Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, this is one of the highlights, definitely. Art by Jim Aparo. Like we said, writing oh, okay. by David Piccolini. Yeah, so this is a good I like one. Jim Aparo. Yeah. yeah, he's great. This is from 1977. And I know you like 70s. So yeah, that's 70s I, is the best era. Yeah. So uh, I got to admit, my girl, I'm a little surprised it's taken, what, 38 episodes to get to Aquaman? Because I thought sure. we'd be reading Aquaman right out of the gate. Oh, really? You love I, Aquaman. I am so a I huge thought, Aquaman fan. Yeah. That's true. He is the character I used on my business card, so... <laughs> <laughs> There's so many problems with that statement. I don't have <laughs> Oh, we'll talk about that later. All right. All right. All right, Michael. Good times. Next week, Aquaman. You got it. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it. Uh, if you're listening at home, you can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all under Comic Book Syndicate to make it confusing as possible. You can also find us on our comicbooksyndicate.com website. <laughs> comicbooksyndicate.com.com. And um, I guess that's about it, right? So we got the Flea Market Fantasy podcast. We got Here Comes the Spider Man uh, podcast. Yeah, Here Comes the Spider Cast. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, uh, the uh, Digging Up uh, King Cadaver podcast. Three podcasts. Right. right. Got on it. Comic Book Syndicate. Yep. Plus, there's movie reviews on there. Um, you know, creator interviews and stuff. So, yeah, it's a good time, definitely. <laughs> All right. There you go. All right. So, yeah, I guess that's it. And uh, until next Tuesday, disperse. <laughs>